What I want to talk about today is a piece of work I did which was supported by Carnegie UK Trust as part of their big program about well-being, kindness, kindness in communities. And the proposal I put to them was let's look at kindness in policy. And the reason I was interested in doing this, because it seemed to me that there was a lot of talk about how people should be nicer to each other in their neighbourhoods, how communities should care for each other more, and an enormous amount of activity going on in communities which demonstrated the very depths of human kindness, depths and heights, I guess. But what was much more difficult was to engage in that conversation with the people who make the rules, create the policies, design the buildings. And so, with the support of Carnegie UK, I started a round of discussions two years ago with people who are leading our big institutions across the UK in all four nations, round tables in each country, but also lots of individual interviews, to say to people, this thing called kindness, what does it mean to you? And I have to say the first response that you always get when you talk about it is, oh God, that's a really difficult thing to talk about. There's almost a physical squirm. I mean, we thought she was serious, thought leader, and now she's talking about kindness. Kindness is quite an embarrassing term for people who run our big hospitals, police services, local authorities and governments, because they're used to other concepts. But then they go on and they say a number of things, and they're different. Kindness, that's nice. A bit busy at the moment to talk about it, but that's a nice thing for other people to do. Kindness, that's cheap. If there was more of that going on in the community, I could manage my budget very much better. Kindness, really? Is that a serious subject for conversation when we are trying to manage these incredibly complex big systems? So that's nice, that's cheap, that's a bit odd. Or yes, kindness, that's about them. I do wish the front line of my services could be kinder. In other words, I wish the people who we pay the least and work the hardest and have so many massive skills in care and health and education should all change their behaviours a bit, but frankly, I'm going to plough on just as I am. And what I identified, and it's in the booklet that's on your table, so this is a bit small, is that actually we talk two languages. And some of us are really fluent in one, and I've called that the rational lexicon. And most of us are quite fluent in the relational lexicon too, particularly when we've taken off our suit and taken off our shoes and we're back at home. Because in the rational lexicon, we talk about things being fair, safe, transparent. We use tools like scrutiny, value for money. We set boundaries and we set targets. And I can talk that language quite well, because I've also run big organisations, and my guess is a lot of you in this room are quite fluent in that language. And then there's another set of languages we use about connection, about hope, about love, about grief. The things we talk about when we're not our professional selves. What I argue in this booklet is we all need to become a bit more bilingual. Both languages matter. Both ways of talking really matter. But it is a bit odd to me that the people who earn the least, who do most of the heavy lifting in our communities, who drive real change on housing estates in Wales and communities all over the country, are really good at talking about friendship and spontaneity and association and how we get on with each other. And quite a lot of the people who make a lot of the decisions that affect all of our lives talk the rational lexicon very well. And why does this matter? You could say it's always been like that. There's always been a formal language and a less formal language. I think it really matters because the big, big challenges facing public policy today are not ones that can be met by any one side of this conversation. We have a real challenge about trust. Just look at what's happening in the House of Commons at the moment. Look at the ways in which people in your communities despair and don't trust the decision makers. Look at all those polls done by Edelman across the world, but also nationally and locally, which show that people trust the services that are closest to them. Most of us trust our GPs more than we trust the health service. Most of us trust the teacher of our children's primary school, but we're not so keen when it gets a bit further away. Trust really matters. 
and that is the currency which public service needs. Speaking one language and not both doesn't help trust. The second reason I think it really matters is because we know that so many of the things that are real challenges to us in society today are not, although they might be, where do we build a road and do we whack in a reservoir there and should we have a nuclear power station? Those decisions need, need making. But so many of the big challenges we face are about how do people's behavior shift? How do we start using plastic less? How do we conserve water more? How do we encourage people to take more exercise and eat better and have healthier lives? Behaviour change requires a very different sort of empathy and understanding than just making a big structural decision. So that's the second reason I think it matters. The third reason it matters is because we want things to work. And we know the research is completely unequivocal that if you are in a care home, and the only time your hand is touched is by somebody who's sticking a needle in in order to take some blood. You feel less cared for, your well-being is lower, and you thrive less well. The Commissioner for Older People in Wales has been clear about that since the days when Ruth was doing that job. It continues to be the case that lonely older people crave a human touch. And yet I've been responsible for care homes where I know quite how difficult it is to tell people that's as much of a value as how accurate you might measure the medicine that you hand out. So the outcomes really make a difference. So for trust, for behaviours, for outcomes, it really matters that we become a bit more bilingual in this way. But there are very good reasons why we don't. I mean, the people who I described at the beginning who said, oh, kindness, that's nice, yes, we should all be kinder, are not really thinking it through. Because kindness involves intuition. It involves empathy. It might involve acting at the edge of your authority. And there are many things going on in public service within which I absolutely bracket large parts of the voluntary sector, because we are all part of services to the public, one way or another, that make this bilingual approach, this more human and connected approach, really challenging. And the first is the levels of public scrutiny that we face. Zoe's excellent presentation just before me talked about the power that social media has given people. It also means that if you're running a housing association, you know that every decision you make will be scrutinised by your residents, and quite rightly so. It's so much easier to retreat to this lexicon and say, I followed the rules, Governor, that's how I operated, and that's why I made that decision. Public scrutiny is real and a demand for transparency is real and neither of those things are wrong but they make it so much easier to retreat to a rules-based approach. And secondly, I think it's hard to do this because our professionalism, which some of us in the voluntary sector have fought really hard to have recognised. We are not amateurs, we behave professionally. We know what professional behaviour involves. Some forms of professionalism respect boundaries. They make sure that you don't get too involved. The very word professionalism is cool and distant and detached. You don't really expect to be hugged by a professional, do you? And yet that might be the thing you most need at a moment of crisis. And all the doctors and nurses I've interviewed say, you have to get over your professional training and know recently bereaved parent needs a hug as much as they need somebody to fill in a form. I would argue very much more. Professionalism which we prize, which matters, is rules-based, and it's really important to us. But it may not be what the people we are talking to need at that moment. There are many incidents in people's lives where they are at their most vulnerable, at their weakest, when a professional response will seem to them to be cold and distant and detached. And we know enough to know what people need. And the fourth, and I think really compelling reason for being really nervous about kindness and clutching our rules rather more energetically than we should, is because we want to be fair. We want people to get the same service. We know that if we just allow people to follow their instincts, I always say this and it always makes people embarrassed, but I should say it again, someone like me is most likely to get a good service from a female GP in her late middle age because she will recognise me and I will recognise her and that evidence is absolutely clear, this is not just my hunch. And that's tricky to say because fairness is a core value for many of us. 
Now, for all of those reasons, for regulation, for scrutiny, for professionalism, for fairness, we have created rules and structures that are much more comfortable on the blue column. And yet we know, we know in our hearts, and we know in our experience, and we know from the evidence, that if we just stick to the safe place of a rational lexicon, we may feel better about it, but the services will not get better. And there is an almost comedic view that comes from the left-hand side, the relational side, that fairness matters above all. And yet we know that regulation, strict as it is, has not got rid of bad behaviour. Regulation is not what drives bad behaviour. Regulation is what intervenes when really bad stuff happens and it will happen. We know that professionalism has not protected people from boundary crossing in inappropriate ways. And we know that a commitment to fairness is not the, as good as we'd like it to be. So I'm arguing that this is a moment for real change, a new response that says, and I'll be saying it later this afternoon, so forgive me if you're gonna hear it twice today, that in a new world where people in communities are doing extraordinary things, they're joining up to be dementia friends, they're organizing circles of support for people with learning disabilities to make sure that people get more than services, young people get taken to the pub as well. They are sharing in communities. It is no longer enough when there's that sort of activity going on in all our communities, when people are giving spare rooms to runaway teenagers or to Syrian refugees, that call in our communities with which the voluntary sector is so closely aligned and has contributed so massively has to be met by a change in our policy. It has to be chain met by a response that says, yes, association matters well-being matters, how we deal with each other really matters. If we see people as simply objects of services, if we see them as them, not as us, our services will never be as good as the people of Wales deserve. That's what I've argued in this publication. I hope you find it interesting. Thank you very much.